So we're just going to let people in as we go now, but we're going to get going because there's so much that we want to share with you in this next hour. So welcome. If we could go to the next slide, please, Jane. Um, my name is Jess Sainsbury. I am FNF's Head of Engagement, and it's so lovely to be hosting today's webinar. So we are um, looking at the preceptorship survey insights that we have run for the second time with um, our friends at the Nursing Time and at Unison. Um, but I've got the boring bit, I'm afraid, so a bit of netiquette. So um, this, this webinar is being recorded, just so you know. Um, so if you don't want your face to be on the recording, then feel free to tell Turn your camera off but we would like to see as many of you as possible um, especially during the end where we've got a bit of a panel session and there's an opportunity for our audience who are joining us live to ask any questions would be lovely to see your faces on there um, please do keep yourselves on mute so that we can hear the speakers um, that would be wonderful and we do have the option um, for you to either raise your hand during the session if I can ask that you wait for questions um, to the end there is a section during this webinar for a Q&A for our lovely panel um, but please do use that chat function throughout because the, the FNF team will be keeping an eye on that as we go through um, and you know this is this is your time so please do try to avoid multitasking like let's fully immerse ourselves in this session. So the format of um, today's webinar is that we are hearing the survey results fresh fresh from the nursing times. So um, Gemma will be running through that with you all. Um, after Gemma has spoken, we have the initial reaction from Lisa, who is our head of policy and influence at the Florence Nightingale Foundation, and also Stuart Tuckwood from Unison. I will let them all introduce themselves officially when we get to that point. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted that we have a panel um, which will consist of our speakers that I've just mentioned, but also some student and early career nurses to hear their thoughts um, so we've got some questions for the panel lined up but please do if you've got any questions as well um, please pop them in the chat or you can ask them verbally towards the end when prompted um, I've done I've done the usual housekeeping that's being recorded all that kind of stuff we do have a hashtag for today so if you're using social media please use hashtag FNF early careers and then the FNF comms team will be able to pick up um, any social activity from you as well we would love to see that so I am gonna I'm gonna stop talking for now and I'm gonna pass to Gemma Mitchell from the Nursing Times who will share some of the findings from the survey. Gemma, over to you. Thanks, Jess. Hi everyone. I'm I'm Gemma. I'm the news editor at Nursing Times. Um, so yeah, we've been working with FNF and Unison for more than two years now to campaign for better preceptorship for newly registered nurses, midwives, and nursing associates. Um, so yeah, a survey we conducted two years ago um, revealed a really sort of concerning picture of the state of preceptorship across the UK. Um, but since then, there have been some positive developments nationally. So there's been some new preceptorship frameworks in England and Northern Ireland. Um, and Wales is due to be publishing something similar soon. Um, so yeah, we thought we would repeat the survey this winter to see if anything had changed in terms of people's access to and experience of preceptorship. Next slide, please. So one of the questions the survey asked was, do registered nurses, newly registered nurses have access to a structured preceptorship program in your organization? Um, you can see there has been an improvement there from two years ago, um, from 64% saying yes to 76% now. Um, but if we can go on to the next slide, you can see that the improvement is even greater when you look at people, only at people who describe themselves as newly registered nurses when they completed the survey. Um, so asked if they had personally been offered a perceptorship when they qualified, 93% of newly registered nurses in this most recent survey said they were compared to 83% two years ago. So that is quite a big increase there. Um, and there was also a rise in newly registered nurses describing the quality of their preceptorship as excellent or good, and an increase in those who had sufficient protected time to benefit from their preceptorship. So, so yes, yeah, some really promising results there. Um, if you go on to the next slide, you can see that improvement reflected in the two nursing times covers from 
2022 on your left, and then the most recent one on the right. So we went with this sort of nautical theme because um, of the sheer amount of people who in the first survey described their experience as being thrown in at the deep end and left to sink and swim. And you can really see that illustrated in that first cover on the left. Um, and then the lighthouse on the right is supposed to sort of signify that preceptorship is starting to now be used better to help newly registered nurses navigate this really challenging transition from student to professional. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, however, not everything in this new survey was rosy, as you would probably expect. Um, so you can see here that the number of people saying that there are enough experienced nurses in their organisation willing to be preceptors stayed low at 34%. So that was the same as two years ago. No improvement there. Um, next slide, please. There were also still some comments from newly registered nurses in this recent survey describing that same sink or swim experience that was prevalent two years ago. You see a couple of other comments there, concerns raised about a lack of specific content for learning disability, mental health and, and children's nurses on their preceptorship programme, this sort of idea that programmes were too adult nursing focused. And um, there were a couple of international nurses as well who said they struggled to access preceptorship despite asking for one. There were also big variations in access between the four UK countries with England and Northern Ireland doing much better than Scotland and Wales. Although it does have to be noted that the majority of our respondents were from England. So that might not be completely accurate representation there for the other countries. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So overall, support for preceptorship remained really strong um, from our respondents. So 97% of registrant respondents and 94% of students describe preceptorship as being vital or fairly important. Um, and you can see here in the circles some of the top reasons why res uh, respondents thought preceptorship was important. Um, and Final slide, please. So to, to sort of wrap up, respondents were really clear about um, what the risks were of failing to get this right, uh, which basically was a deepening of the workforce crisis in the NHS, which is articulated here from one newly registered nurse in Scotland. Um, thank you. That's it from me. So you can, the full results are available on the Nursing Times website if you, if you want to see more, but they were really the, the highlights. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us all, Gemma. So next, I'm going to invite the initial reaction from both Unison and FNF. So we are going to we're going to take the, the slides down so we can see your faces, which is lovely. So Stuart, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Jess. And thank you very much, Gemma, for taking us through the, the findings there. Hi, everybody. Welcome to everyone who's joined the webinar. We've got really good attendance. So it's great to, great to see you all. Everyone can hear me, I assume. You can hear me, Jess? Yeah. Great. Um, so I'm yeah I'm Stuart Tupper. I'm the National Officer for Nursing at Unison. So I work in our national health team. Um, and preceptorships, uh, for, for the reasons that Gemma explained, have been a really top priority for us over the last couple of years. Um, it really came about because we had so many early career nurses and so many student nurses coming to us during the COVID pandemic, and at the end of it, explaining um, just how different things were in practice and how much they really would value extra support and more supervision more help when they transitioned into their registered roles. Um, so that's where we were a few a couple of years ago. Um, and it was really great to be able to have that initial survey and then also to follow up with the work we've done over the last couple of years. And uh, I'm really encouraged uh, in terms of my response to these initial results. I think they're, they're very encouraging. There's a few reasons to, um, to still obviously con continue campaigning on this and think about what we need to do next. But I think it's important to take uh, a second to reflect and a second to celebrate on obviously the great work that's taken place over the last couple of years. Um, I won't reiterate all the findings that Gemma have been through, but in particular, the two things that stood out the most for me that I'm the most happy about are um, the reflections from newly registered nurses on how they value their perceptive experience and whether it was um, whether it was good or excellent. That almost doubled in the last two years, which I think is incredible and really testament to the hard work that people have done in practice to improve that support for newly registered nurses to improve their perceptive programmes. But also, um, we've been very, very keen to highlight, very keen to reiterate over the last few years, every time we're talking about 
preceptorship, that it's important that everybody gets sufficient time and space in clinical practice to benefit from preceptorship. So um, it can be a tick box exercise. It can be something that people don't think is meaningful. And obviously to do that, you need the time to stop, move away from the clinical area, meet someone, reflect on the findings. And so I think the um, the finding from the survey that, uh, again, there was a doubling of people who said that they had sufficient time to benefit benefit from their preceptorship program. That's very, very encouraging as well. And I picked up just one really nice comment, which I think illustrated this, which was a, a newly registered nurse just saying, it was a great support, allowed the time for me to build my confidence, having a person who was there to support me through my, my first year, um, which I think really sums up, you know, the value, the confidence and the support that you can get from a preceptorship program. So I'm really encouraged. I think it's great um, progress of preceptorships that, that we see, and that's partly down to the campaigning work that we've done. So thank you to our partners in the Nursing Times and the FNF. But in reality, it's all down to the people who've been out there in practice, um, building those preceptorship programs, educating preceptors, supporting the preceptees, making sure that everyone has access to the programs. And I know there's a lot of people who are on the webinar this afternoon who have done that really hard work over the last couple of years. So I think it's you guys that deserve the biggest thank you, the biggest credit for making that meaningful difference to people in practice. I've been out there quite a lot in the last few months, visiting places and speaking to newly registered nurses and staff. Um, and I think we probably all understand that what's happening in practice isn't where we want it to be. There's still obviously a big crisis in the NHS with waiting lists and the complexity of care and the struggles that everyone's having. So I think it's really important to reflect on that. And I, and I think though there has been a lot of progress in terms of training nurses, bringing um, nurses from over, overseas and building the workforce, we've got more nurses out there in practice than we have done in previous years. That has an impact on the skill mix uh, that people are working in and the experience within those teams. So I actually think it's more important than ever, actually, that we really focus on having the right support and the right opportunity to help people when they come into their first registered roles. Um, I've been going to places where newly registered nurses are working by themselves, leading teams, you know, working with nursing associates and other more junior nurses. And, and it's really important they have the right support and help. So we've definitely still got work to do. Um, and I think a few of those comments that Gemma picked up as well are so incredibly important about the need for preceptorships to be specific to the setting that people are working in, to be meeting their individual needs. So, again, it can't be a, a one-size-fits-all approach to, to preceptorships, definitely. So I think, in conclusion, really, it's, you know, we've made great progress and I'm really encouraged by the results and thank you to all the great work that everybody's done. But it's definitely just one step on the path to the support that everyone needs in practice and you know we've taken a few important steps we've definitely made progress but it's not time to take our eye off the ball and there's still obviously a lot of work that needs to be done so i'm really hopeful that we'll continue to build on this great work work together with our partners in practice and and see more development in the future so thank you all i'm happy to come back in later as well i'll pass over to lisa thanks Stuart. over to you lisa great um thank you so much Stuart, and thank you jess and thank you all for having me here today um my name is Lisa Plotkin and I'm the head of policy and influence at FNF. And I'm here to feedback some of our initial thoughts on what we think that these findings are telling us. And I want in my limited time to really focus on two things that I think we need moving forward. So first, as you all just have heard, the findings speak to considerable improvement over a short period of time, both in terms of the provision of and quality of preceptorship programs. And at Florence, we think that it's really important moving forward to kind of unpick those a little bit. So understand those enabling factors a little bit more. And the survey gives us a good starter for 10 on unpacking that a little bit. So one of the first enablers I wanna reflect on is as Stuart mentioned, that importance of protected time. So really survey comments throughout show, showed that this is a key enabler. As one respondent said, I needed that protected time to learn, develop, and study new skills that are needed for the job rather than be overwhelmed with working in a new role and then trying to squeeze in that learning here and there. In the survey, we also heard a lot about the importance of consistency as a key enabler for good preceptorship. So we heard that when an assigned preceptor is always changing, this can lead to confusion, but when it's the reverse, it leads to greater trust and a greater a more positive experience. And it's vital that a well-trained <clears throat> preceptor is able to provide that consistent commitment. And that brings me back to that protected time point. It matters for the preceptor, but we almost heard that, it, I mean, for, for the preceptee, but we heard that it just matters just as much for the preceptor, that they have that time 
to enable them to show up consistently. And I think we need to get better at showcasing how some organizations are working to ensure this happens amongst so many other competing priorities. And then finally, I'll return to something that Stuart just mentioned, and that's that importance of flexibility. So reading through the hundreds of free text comments in this survey, I was struck by how often respondents brought up this idea of flexibility or tailoring the program to the individual. So respondents discussed how internationally educated colleagues might need something different to nursing associates who might need something different to people in community or adult settings. And I think it's a really big challenge to kind of get that balance right between kind of one size fits all and a thousand flowers blooming. We don't want that. We want something in the middle in that sweet spot. And I think that that's really, really hard to do. So I would really welcome kind of people giving us their, um, you know, showcasing what they're doing to make that work. Um, so those are some of the enablers. And the second thing that I wanted to touch on is just evaluation or data. So although now it seems that there's this consensus building about the importance of preceptorship, there really is no guarantee that organizations or systems will fund or continue to prioritize this. Um, this means that we need to be constantly demonstrating the value of, of investing in preceptorship. And the fact of the matter is, is that the evidence base for justifying this investment is actually pretty weak. As various policy documents have noted, there's a lack of rigorous evidence around the benefits of preceptorship programs, um, particularly in terms of evidence that preceptorships achieve some of the key outcomes, which are often claimed, especially that patient safety point, but also around retention rates. And that's why it's so welcome and important that the NMC's preceptorship principles talks about the importance of evaluation and stipulates that each organization should evaluate its programs. Um, but the challenge with all of these things is that evaluation is usually something that among so many pressures kind of falls off the agenda. And also the evaluation that the NMC talks about is just organization by organization, and that doesn't actually help comparison. So you can't have one one place compare how they're doing to their neighbor to be able to say, hey, look, our neighbor's doing this really well and look at their retention rates, look at their safety rates, look at all of these other indicators. So we should be doing that too. If you don't have a kind of publicly available data set or kind of sharing of, of that type of data, then, then you can't really make the case as effectively as you might be able to. So um, I think that's something that really matters and something that we kind of haven't gotten kind of our, our handle on yet, but I think that that's only to be expected with so much kind of new momentum around this agenda. Um, and that's really it from me. So now I'll, ha I'll hand back to Jess and the rest of the panel. Thanks so much, Lisa. Brilliant. So um, for the next section of today's session, what we're going to do is we have a panel which will be made up of the speakers that you've just heard from, but also we have um, two nursing students and a newly registered nurse as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask our student nurses, followed by our newly registered nurse, to introduce themselves and give their initial uh, reflections. Um, for our students, it'll be more around their kind of hopes for preceptorship, and it'll be really interesting to hear from our newly registered nurse on their experience of preceptorship so far. We do have some questions for our whole panel but now is the time for those of you who have joined us live today to start popping your questions in the chat for us and we will keep an eye on that as well. So Sunny can I ask you to introduce yourself and also your your reactions as well your reflections. Okay, good afternoon everyone, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Sunny, I'm a final year student nurse at the University of Essex. And um, when I went through the preceptorship survey, um, it was quite interesting because most of the things and the challenges that we face whilst we're currently student nurses on placement is the same experience the preceptorships are experiencing while they're on their preceptorship journey, which includes not enough sacred time and not enough senior staff due to the retention. But there's this always the statistics that always ring in my head that the rate of retention for newly qualified nurses is always in the first year. And the first year, that means it's just within the time of the preceptorship journeys. So I wanted to delve into the fact to see the retention rate for preceptorship for this year to compare it with the statistics, but I couldn't find that. But if we are on placement and we're having challenges and then we go on preceptorship, we're having challenges, then that would signify, signify the, 
the big burnout that we are experiencing because we struggled for three years. And then when we get our pin and go into the real world, we are still challenge, having challenges. So that is the part that stood out for me that what is the future for us going forward? Thank you. Wonderful, thanks so much, Sunny. And Natasha, over to you. Thanks, Jess. Um, afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real privilege to be able to kind of offer some insight from the student perspective on something like this. Um, my name's Natasha. I'm a final year paediatric nursing student at the University of Winchester. Um, I am currently, um, as I'm sure you are, Sunny, in the horrible process at the moment of beginning to apply for jobs. Um, and yes. <laughs> really bring the concept of a preceptorship into that decision making process, which um, given the current climate is is no kind of mean feat. Um, I, I guess to kind of echo again uh, what Sunny said, I think a lot of my concern in the same way does stem from that kind of concept of investment. Um, I think as you are a student nurse and you go through a programme, I have oftentimes found myself quite um, split in terms of um, where not only where my loyalties lie, but also whose responsibility I am, um, my development and my learning, who that kind of belongs to. And ultimately, I know it belongs to myself. And I think that that is something I've kind of had to maybe learn the hard way over the course of the program. But I do belong to an HEI. And when I am on placement, I do belong to that practice area at the same time. And, and you would hope that they would both be equally as invested in my development as each other. But oftentimes, and I've I've made this joke several times over the last three years, I find myself often feeling like a child of divorce, um, where each parent is blaming each other for the fall downs and the shortcomings of my education and my practice experience. So I suppose coming into practice, um, when I do join the register, my hope is that wherever I end up taking my first post, that that place will be committed to my development and the preceptorship will be the key to that. But it's just not something as of yet that I've experienced while I've been out on placement. Um, so that there is a real concern that that I won't kind of get that sense of somebody investing in me and investing in my future. Um, and it, with, with the sheer number of vacancies available, it, it does kind of beg the question, you know, will I in return see those opportunities as a potential for, for me investing in them and, and to kind of return that and stay and be loyal and um, get the most out of a, a, a my first position? Or actually, will I go where the opportunities take me and, and kind of go perhaps where someone else does recognize my potential and, and is able to perhaps put slightly more into my future and my development. So what's to think about it? It's very, very stressful. So hopefully if anyone has any answers, I would I would love to hear them. It will be okay. <laughs> I love that. It will be OK. Thank you very much, Natasha. Um, and next up, Cecil, um, you are the newly registered nurse on the panel. Please do introduce yourself and we'd love to hear your reflections on the survey results and actually your experiences of preceptorship so far. We can't hear you. Pop yourself back on mute and you're off mute again. Let's try again. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. You are quite okay. faint, so do speak up. I know you are in a clinical, you're at work today, aren't you? But thank you, Cecil. Yes, I do apologise about the stress I've given you since last night. I just did not realise. I guess that's part of being a newly registered nurse now. Um, so I am Cecil, for those that don't know me, I have been qualified. I qualified in October 2022, so been in practice since then. And um, my experience as a newly registered nurse have been quite unique, I believe, because coming from being a very, very active um, Gobby student nurse to then having to become part of the NHS family and then kind of find that I have a hierarchy and you need to kind of fit into it. And also um, you can't just go about and say, this is what I want to do. This is what my learnings um, I want to achieve from this year. You can to certain degrees, but also your main priority then lies within clinical practice and what you can get from your clinical practice. Um, so 
I personally think it's not good enough with what the level of receptorship we get. It's 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 getting there, but also it's not because um personally I have spoken to my colleagues and peers that started receptorship courses with me when we started working um in the trust I work at. And it was quite tricky because most of the times I heard comments like, I am I'm only here because it gets counted as clinical hours, I'm getting paid for it, or it is something that I don't have to be at work for. I can just sit, come, have a cup of coffee and go home. And I really felt very upset about it because I thought receptorship would be the time where, one, we would create really good peer sort of groups that would be supportive, um, sharing these experiences, learn from them, provide that support that we desperately need, um, especially with the pressures that we are facing currently um, to a point I had to rush in here and I have to leave so I, I'm going to keep this very brief but I really believe the statistics sound really interesting and fun but I really like to hear like the personal experiences from these newly registered nurses um, because what I really I'm worried is people are fearful of what the outcomes will be if they speak up about anything um, I have also seen newly registered nurses so upset that they left profession. I probably... I'm not sure if it's just my connection, but I can't hear Caesar at the moment. Is that the case? Just finish it off uh, with one sentence anyways. Um, so what I was just saying there is just my last sentence to end off would be um, what I would love for preceptorship to become is more of a supportive peer group Um session rather than being somewhere that you go in as a lesson environment something that you've already seen and done at university it's 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 definitely not what I would have wanted or I know that some of my peers have not wanted um to some of my peers have not even completed their preceptorship because they just thought that it was such um not good use of their time they learned better being with their peers and their staff members so Definitely statistics sound good to me with all the data that they've said, but I would definitely, definitely want to learn, um, hear more from the peers. Um, obviously, without the fear and the um, sort of environment that they're encouraged to speak up, to say what they want and receive what they want, not just say, because unfortunately I've learned the hard way that you can speak up, you can raise it to multiple people and ask different people to do different things but unfortunately what you hear is we have got gold standard preceptorship framework currently in our trust and there is um, only little work that needs to be done to make it to what you want it to be because again if it's just one person saying and asking for these things nobody can listen so we need that support group again I come back to that if we need that supportive um, group that can raise that voice and become that joint sort of body that raises this is not what we want there are personalized needs that we all have and that is what we really need to focus on thank you wonderful thank you so much Cecil and thanks for persisting with the what I can assume is NHS wi-fi um you did great and thank you so much um, both to Natasha and Sunny as well. So um, I will be going back to our um, to, to Gemma, to Stuart and to Lisa, but Sunny, I can see that your hand is raised there. So did you want to respond to anything that Cecil's just shared? Yes, um, I, I just wanted to summarise um, certain factors that my colleagues were just sharing with us. Um, Natasha says that, that she feels as if that she's not owned by anyone and sees herself that the statistics isn't really representing what the data is saying because the fear of being honest with yourself. But then I had this thought that, you know, when we finish our nursing journey and we end up on the preceptorship role, I wondered if there could be a collaboration with the university so that we're not just thrown out there in the deep end, that we are still connected to someone. So, you know, they're, they look after us whilst we're on placement and yet we're then given over to the trust, there would still be a form of communication in the middle, a connection with the university and us to see where our parties are, how we ended up. And by then we can really 
express ourselves to say how we really feel about the preceptorship program. And then there would be a trail documentation of real life experience of student nurse leaving university, going to a particular trust with their preceptorship program. And at the end, how did they fare? That was just an idea that came in. Thank you. That's a great idea, Sunny. And I would invite um, our, our audience who are joining us live today um, to hear their reflections on that as a suggestion as well as we go through. Please do use that chat function, any kind of reflections, feedback, um, both from those of you who are on our panel, but also the wider audience as well, because I can see that there are a lot of names there who are doing great work when it comes to preceptorship or are supporting those transitioning too. So Gemma, I'm going to come to you first, um, but we have from uh, our student and early career panel around uh, you know the voice and experiences of student and early career nurses but how can media outlets like the nursing times help amplify their voices um, and influence that positive change based on the survey findings yeah I think we just are going to use our platform that we have to continue to, to put a spotlight on this issue like we have been the past two years um, you know, we've, we run these survey findings over four pages in the February magazine and put it on the front cover and um, you can find the, the results on the website. So, yeah, we're really trying to um, give them a lot of prominence um, and we will certainly continue to use our positions to hold leaders to account on, on the promises that they've been making in terms of these new frameworks that are coming out and new standards. Um, and just to sort of follow up on what Caesar was saying about sort of in her organization they have the gold standards but that's not necessarily sort of felt by those on the ground we we heard that quite a lot in the findings of people saying that they didn't get what they were promised once they actually started in their role um which is really concerning because you know people can introduce all these things and, and have great ambitions but it's the experience of those on the ground that really counts so um yeah i mean if anyone any newly registered nurses want to get in touch with us to talk about a positive or a negative experience please do i put my email in the chat and um we, we can try and see if we can promote it great thanks Gemma. um and stuart and lisa did you want to come in um on that question at all if I could just come in with some reflections on what our uh, students and our career nurses said, if that's all right, Jess. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you to three of you for your comments. It was all really, all very insightful and very helpful. The, I'm, I'm encouraged about the, with the progress we've made that I've said, but actually, I think, you know, when you, when you reflect on the numbers, it's still obviously worrying that the majority still don't rate their perceptorship if they had one as good or excellent. Um, and I think, you know, we're missing such a huge opportunity there with, with so many nurses having perceptorships who still don't really think they're that good. And obviously we've heard from Sunny and Cecil and Natasha about that. Um, and so there's there's definitely so much more potential for what we could do if we can get the majority thinking their perceptorship programs are good or excellent. Um, we can't afford to lose any nurses really, but we also can't afford to not develop our nurses and build on their potential and get them working to the level that they can do. And so, it's, yeah, it's good progress to have perceptorship policies out there and to have the time, but also we want them all to be good and we want people really to be benefited from them. Um, and it was really interesting hearing from Cecil and I think, you know, the uh, reflections on what it's like in practice. I mean, not being able to get the time, not being able to get the Wi-Fi to be able to take part in these kind of things. So there's a bit about the NHS uh, workplace and what it's like working out there. The crucial elements to make a workplace a good workplace to be in are all things that make a good perception, a good perception as well, if you, if you follow what I'm saying, you know, having the time, being able to reflect with people, being able to make the most of, of what you're doing. So places that are struggling to give their, their workforce a good work environment will obviously struggle to give a good perception as well. So we need to be trying to sample those things in tandem. But, there's, you know, as I said, there's so much potential there and there's so much we can get from these perception programs and support on newly registered nurses. So I'm really positive about doing that work and continuing to improve. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, and I can see that Cecil's hand is up. So Cecil, did you want to come in? Uh, literally two seconds. I will take only two seconds. It's, um, I just wanted to make sure that I also share like the two seconds of positivity that I do have for my job. It is not all negative and I promise you that we are supported. But I believe what I wanted to say is 
in my local sort of specialist area that I work in, my ward has been super supportive. So I'm a gynae nurse. Um, I won't even get into the um, comments that I had of why do you actually want to start becoming um, from a specialist area? Uh, that is for another day. But I believe that starting from a specialist area has actually given me more support than being in a um, sur surgical or medical, just generalized area. So um, I have been put on like specialist training, so early pregnancy loss trainings, um, second trimester loss trainings, any of those specialist trainings that I would have required or the support that I would have required in my local sort of ward-based environment, I've absolutely received those. But like what Stuart said or someone else before that as well said is the promises that were made when they were almost... Um, selling themselves and when I say themselves is a trust so when we were at university all the trust came to us they offered us and they told us what they could provide for us um it almost felt like we were sold a lie basically is this is what you're gonna get but ultimately it wasn't what we received so um it's not all bad there is good there is still a lot of good left in the NHS I guess what is sad is that it's just maybe not enough or not to the level that we really need. Thanks, Cecil, and thanks for shining a light on the good stuff as well. That's always nice to hear. And that is actually, I know I'm here to host, um, but I just wanted to share that at FNF, we have an early career subject expert group. And I had a one to one um, with one of the newer members very recently in the last couple of weeks. And his initial reflection on his perception experience so far, four months in, was that um, it the kind of the generic offer of the preceptorship wasn't that great yet that kind of personalized pathway that um a registrant in practice was helping them carve out was a what was retaining them to that place of work but was also kind of keeping them uh, aware of the possibilities and what they could potentially do with their career but i'll stop there lisa did you want to come in with any reflections from our student and early career panel yeah. Yeah, I mean, thanks, Jess. I think that last point that you just touched on is a, is a really important one and what Cecil was saying about the kind of expectation management, um, because if, if you know, what, one of the things we, we did hear in those comments is about the kind of expectations not aligning with experience, but but there being other informal sources of support. Um, and so I think that it's just really important to understand what is what a preceptorship is supposed to offer someone who's newly qualified versus what are those other kinds of informal support networks, places where they can go, just so that that misalignment isn't isn't there. Because I think if you were to ask, you know, someone what does good look like, they would come back with very variable lists. And so I think unless we understand where that starting point is, we're not going to really be able to evaluate properly kind of what what impact these programs are having. Brilliant. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'm going to come back to um, Sunny and Natasha, if that's OK. I'm just going through what's coming in the chat. Um, but but Steve has asked, I wonder how much emphasis on perceptorship is emphasised in attracting recruits. So you guys who are thinking about it right now um, and how many job seekers prioritise perceptorship as a reason to choose an employer. So I guess my question to Sunny and Natasha is, is that high on your list of priorities when you're thinking about where are you going to go with your, your first post? So sorry, the line just went funny and I didn't hear your question. My apologies. That's OK. The question is, with preceptorship, is that kind of high on your pick list when you're thinking of which employer to, to go to for your first post? Funny enough, um, whilst I was on my last placement, I was recruited for my preceptorship role. And um, so for me, going forward, I had looked at their preceptorship program and I'd gotten good feedback from it. I'd gotten feedback from all the newly qualified student nurses who were already working for the company and they told me about the preceptorship program. And then I looked at it and it was quite structured and really good. So to be quite honest, I haven't gone further to look because it's scary because the other student nurses that are ahead of me that has gone to settings, they have complained, they have cried. As for me, I'm not going that route because they 
may be oh, worried I'm from. And I think for me, it's beneficial, but I'm still advocating for those that are struggling on their preceptorship journey. Fab. Thanks, Sunny. Um, a couple of points were missed there, I think, just because of connection, but we, we got the gist of it. So thank you for sharing that. Natasha, did you want to come in at all? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think um, it it is something that I am certainly looking for as I'm looking at posts and I'm, I'm looking at my options I'm in a really fortunate position I don't kind of have any ties as such um so I you know the world is kind of my oyster now that I'm looking at, at newly qualified roles but that said I and I don't know if my colleagues on other small branches of nursing find the same thing but looking for the type of pediatric role that I'm looking for which is ideally something away from a ward-based environment to find something like that full stop that will accept a newly qualified nurse um impedes in perhaps some kind of a community setting or even an education setting that then has a preceptorship program on top it feels like looking for a needle in a haystack I'm not even convinced that such roles exist and they certainly don't seem to crop up with any regularity on NHS jobs or, or any of the other kind of obvious platforms um, I have a, a really um, good friend and, and colleague who is the, the year above who uh, trained at King's and is now on an incredible preceptorship program um, within a GP setting um, and she is rubbing her hands together every day of the week, loving life um, and kind of bragging to anyone who will listen about her experience because she is having what she would say is is an exceptional experience and a phenomenal time. She is the only one of my many colleagues and friends that I'm aware of that is having even something above a neutral experience, I would say. She does very much seem to be the minority. I'm thrilled that she's having a great time. I'm incredibly jealous. Um, but again, these things don't, always seem to translate um, and again I'm just speaking for myself on behalf of the pediatric branch but I, I understand that my colleagues within mental health and within LD are, are finding kind of similar experiences whereby if, if they are kind of looking slightly beyond you know the, the beaten track um, for their newly qualified roles um, it, it's either not an option for us as, as newly qualified so they're looking for one to two years minimum of experience before we're able to go into a community position or something in that vein um, but then if you are able to find somewhere that would consider you into that role there is no preceptorship program there waiting for you so it's kind of that trade-off do I sacrifice the the type of job that I want coming onto the register and, and actually for me it's more the type of life that I want because the work-life balance is is of increasing importance to me as a um, not even mature student but extra mature student at this point um, but so do I would I take that would I sacrifice my lifestyle and and the type of job that I envisaged for myself after four really hard years of training or do I push and strive and you know really fight for the type of job that I want and the type of life that I want but then actually there isn't that structured support in place waiting for me and just kind of hope that like the girl said there are maybe other avenues of support available to me when I get there but it is kind of a gamble if if that's if I'm making that clear to everybody um, and it's just a real shame I think that after all this work and all this effort and all this money and the blood the sweat and the tears and everything else maybe a kidney that I've thrown into becoming registered that I do have to sacrifice in any way shape or form it kind of seems ludicrous to me with the job numbers being what they are the state of the NHS being what it is there are no shortage of vacancies for you know people like myself people who are passionate about their industry and people who want to come in to nursing and make a dent and make waves and question practice and make it better for the cohorts coming in behind us so why isn't there a place for me in either one of those camps that actually works it's it's just it's a really difficult um question to kind of ask myself I guess I do know sadly that people who are in the same position Thanks so much for sharing that, Natasha. And I can see that there have been um, some responses to what everyone's been saying in the chat as well. So please, please do check that out. And again, for our audience, if these things are happening in your area, then please share that so we can you know, share amongst our student and early career networks um, and shine a bit of light on that from the FNF platform's perspective also. Um, so 
Cesar, I'm very conscious of time for you. Um, so I can see that you've been answering some questions in the chat, but I wondered whether you wanted to come in with any reflections before you needed to leave us. Um, so, no, I think I've covered most of it, but um, I completely understand, like, where um, Natasha uh, has been coming from. It's like, um, it, it just feels like very hit and miss sometimes. It's like, um, you some sometimes you can expect, depending on who you speak with, um, that they will listen to you and sort of raise those concerns to the right positions. Um, so recently... Um, one of our chief nurses has moved on to new pastures new and I felt almost it it felt like a little bit of a broken uh, relationship there because I felt it's something that should have carried on with uh, the different people that are coming into that role um, but unfortunately it, it just feels like sometimes it, it depends on which people are in those roles and which people are championing so if you have the right champions and the right people championing the um, newly qualified nurses or uh, student nurses experiences to be positive and supportive it's only then um, that you find those trust those um those organizations doing the most so um especially like knowing you long enough i know how much fnf has I mean, I know they were already doing enough in the area, but since you being part of FNF, I strongly, strongly, strongly believe there has been so much more room in on the table for student nurses and newly registered nurses or early career nurses. So thanks to you <laughs> that it is something that is being um, spoken about and it's echoed across but I think we're still in the baby stages where we need those people in the right rooms to create that noise but it shouldn't be like that it shouldn't be uh, down to those few people that have to champion that have to create that noise it should be down to all of us it should be our, all of our priorities to make sure that the future of our nursing careers is supported it is getting the right level of support and um everything they need to be honest everything they need because we desperately need those people to stay in the profession thanks Cecil. um lisa I'm, I'm conscious of time guys i can't believe we've only got 10 minutes left but i'm going to come to lisa next so so lisa what policy recommendations or actions do you believe should be prioritized based on the insights gleaned from the survey and how can organizations like fnf like unison like those of us who are from in the audience today and obviously nursing times as well drive that meaningful change in this area Thanks, Jess. I mean, I think I think people have, have covered it in terms of um, what FNF can can do to drive change in this area. And thank you, Cecil, for those kind of kind kind words. I mean, this is definitely a priority for FNF, and I think that organisations like Florence and like Unison can just keep kind of shining a light on this and keep collecting that that evidence and that data. I mean, I feel like I'm always banging on about data, but you know, we do need to have evidence like this to be able to spark kind of national conversations. And we do need to have evidence at organizational level to talk about the impact that these programs are making and also to have an honest conversation about what is and what isn't working. Um, in terms of more national level policy aspirations, I mean, I think, I think it was in NHS England's long-term workforce plan that, um, it pledged to support all trusts to adopt national preceptorship framework, but there was no additional funding or resource or um, sort of mechanisms, you know, to, to, to support that. So I would say that's something that needs to be built on because that plan is going to be reiterated within the next couple of years. So we need to start building that evidence base now as to the difference these programs are making so that in the next iteration, there can be a little bit more teeth or a little bit more specificity around some of those aspirations. And then I think it's just back to that um, evaluation and, and, and data set point. I would love to be able to get, for us to get better at um, quantifying the difference that preceptorship is making to outcomes, but also to retention and intention to stay. And then also to have an idea about how that splits around demographic groups as well, because I think some people will need different different support and we should be cognizant of, of that from a kind of EDI perspective as, as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. And Stuart, can I come to you next? Um, so how can unions like Unison, I know you have touched on this already, but just if you wanted to expand, um, but how can unions 
like Unison, work collaboratively with healthcare organisations and policymakers to address the issues identified in the survey and improve perceptual programmes further on top of the work, good work that has already been done. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I've got a few thoughts. First of all, it sounds like Sonny and Natasha are getting themselves job offers in the chat if you want to have a little look. So that's obviously been a good platform for you. Uh, there's, yeah, there's lots of things we can do. I mean, first of all, just to say at the national level, um, as well as sitting on the kind of steering group for the National Perceptorship Programme in England, which has meant we've been able to input into that from Unison and talk about the support that we think people need. We've also made this a really high priority for us in Unison. So um, at the end of the pay dispute last year, there was a number of agreements we made with the NHS about things other than pay that we said are, you know, are up there in terms of high importance as well. Um, and the work from those agreements is still ongoing. So we're negotiating with the NHS about support for all new registrants, but also about career progression opportunities for nurses. And this kind of information, this kind of discussion is stuff that we can bring into those discussions to make sure we're asking for things that are really meaningful. And that's a, a marker of how important we take this. Um, but we're only able to have those conversations and, and those negotiations because we've got the strength of our membership and because our active members took action in that pay dispute last year. So it is something we, we are prioritising highly. But at the local level as well, we can do a lot. So, um, you know, um, NHS organisations should all have policies in place for their perceptionship programmes. And those policies normally run through a, a negotiation committee with local staff side trade unions. So that's an opportunity for unions to be scrutinising and making sure the policies are good and that they're making a difference in practice. And also just then at that individual level as well, um, as lots of our early career nurses have said, and what I've heard from lots of others as well, if you're feeling like that you're not getting the support that you were promised or the policy's there, but it's not being followed up in practice, you know, if there's a policy that says you should have protected time to benefit from your perception and the, and the organisation isn't delivering that, then you've got a right to go and complain about that, to escalate that within your organisation. And obviously, as a newly registered nurse, that can be difficult. So go and speak to a union rep, get some advice, bring that up and really put some pressure on the organisation to make sure you are getting what you're entitled to and what you've been promised. Recognise that isn't always easy, but um, it only happens if people are willing to kind of speak up and challenge it collectively, as it's been said. So those are a few thoughts. Thanks, Jess. Thanks so much, Stuart. Um, so I'm afraid, everyone, we only have five minutes until the end of today's session. So I'm going to ask our panel briefly, if you may, if there are five of you. Cecil has had to leave us now um, to refuel before she joins the rest of her shift but if our panel could just share any kind of final reflections maybe even a call to action if you have one um so sunny i'm going to come to you first so for me my call to action is that i think student nurse should be carried out on their journey whilst they go through the preceptorship program and have someone that they can reach back to as in touch base I also wanted to find out, you know, that um, with the new structure implementation and there was an increase of, I think, 13% from students being aware of what the new preceptorship program was. Was it being aware because it was advertised or knowledge or being aware that it exists? I would like to know what that increase is, just out of curiosity, because if, it, if the structure has been improved, yet the findings are still the same, what effect was the improvement? Was it more knowledge, more awareness? So moving forward i would just try to delve into that to find out is it that it was just advertised more but then as cecil says that the expectation isn't matching the experience so with the increase is it just increase okay more availability of preceptorship program so it could be more availability but then the problems and the limitations are still there but there is another factor that um came out in the findings that wasn't covered was the the new intake of overseas nurses and how it will how they are not being represented well or they're having negative experience in the preceptorship um, role. And um, I would love for overseas nurses to get more help. So I'm advocating for them because whilst we are UK trained, we have different departments we can go to for help. And I think for them, they don't feel more that confident in reaching out. So even though it's not an area that I'm here for, I'm still advocating for them. So that's my final piece. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Sunny, and great advocating there for sure. Natasha, I'm gonna to come to you next for your final reflections. Yeah, I think it's just for, for those running the programs and, and maybe areas where they don't exist, but there is room for them to exist. I know it would take a, a level of initial influx of resource, of time, of effort, of maybe even money in some cases. Um, and I know it's really difficult to be able to justify that when you're not immediately seeing any kind of payoff. But I think from our perspective, I, I kind of 
can semi promise you that there would be a payoff. It might just take a minute for, for you to see that um, a little ways down the line. But for us, immediately, we would feel and recognize that investment in us and appreciate that on a, a psychological level. Um, so even though it might not make a dent in your numbers initially, it, it might still make a massive difference to your um, retention future down the line. Thanks, Natasha. And Gemma, over to you. I'll just keep it really brief and say thank you to all those who took part in the survey and who shared their experiences today because it's really you know we can't do any campaigning or highlight any issues without without getting that feedback from you so um yeah just thank you and, and continue to stay in touch with me if there's anything about perceptorship that you want to highlight thanks Gemma and Stuart yeah likewise thank you to everybody it's been a great session today as well we've made some great progress and you know as we've heard from natasha and the others that will make a huge difference to individuals um, and we are seeing a shift in some of the data as well but there is still work to be done so my call to action is obviously to recommit and make sure that we all continue to del deliver on that so thank you everybody thanks Stuart. and last but not least lisa yeah, hi, we just we just echo that huge thank you to everyone who, who took the survey and to Natasha and Sunny um, for, for being here today to share experiences. Um, I think my call for to FNF is that we, as just said, we have an FNF um, early career subject expert group, and I'd like us to do something more with, with, with these findings and consider what, what, what next for, for us in this space. Brilliant. So a huge thank you for me to all of our panel members, but especially to our audience as well who have joined us live today and those of you who have completed the survey and shared that amongst your networks. Um, please do keep in touch. If we are able to flash up the last slide, we've got some how to keep in touch with FNF. Um, but for those of you who've joined us live, you will be sent the link to the recording afterwards and it will be made available on FNF's YouTube shortly afterwards as well. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Um, and thank you for sharing your reflections as well in the chat. We will pick those up afterwards. Um, and we hope to see you at our next webinar, which is taking place on the 29th of February on the Leap Day. Um, so that bonus day is some time for you to invest in yourself with CPD. Um, please do join us because that's our kind of um, our webinar for some members of our subject expert groups will be sharing their work and hopes and goals for the year going ahead. But have a lovely afternoon, everyone, and see you all soon. And if our panel members could hang on the call, if you're able to, that would be great.